and welcome to the Wine Access Unfiltered Podcast. It's 2023 in the springtime. We are all back from some vacations, some wine yeah, travels. Some work stuff. Yeah, we always call it work. It's always <laughs> always work. Always work. Always work. <laughs> but fun vacations as well. Fun vacations. Well, Eduardo and Lara, of course, the Wine Access team, here to join me on a subject that I actually don't have a lot of experience in. So I'm so really going to lean on you guys a little bit because I know sure. you're more experienced in this department. But before we get there, I really want to talk about, yes, yeah, Spain, I'm, of course. Gonna yeah, you're going to yeah. you're gonna not bury the lead. We're talking about Spain today, of course. Um, before we get there, I kind of wanted to do two things. One, I wanted to find out from you guys because you had such exciting summers what was the fa- what was the favorite? Where did you go that you're like everyone needs to go there now? It's a tough one. Uh, I did a little bit of travel this summer. Tuscany was always, you know, Italy is always fantastic. The food, the wine, yeah. just the energy of it. Um, also had a great little weekend trip down to Mexico City um, to see to see some music and uh, who did you see by chance <laughs> was it a fellow wine lover uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah I think so uh, yeah saw Taylor Swift down in Mexico nice. had some fantastic fantastic food great dining just a beautiful city to walk around yeah. in um, and and so yeah that was those were some yeah, highlights we've, we've for been to Mexico City a few times but yeah. this was by far the best trip gastronomical speaking yeah uh, the food, the people, the weather, it all helped and obviously enhanced by, by the show. That was the excuse. I mean, Taylor brings it up a notch, right? Uh, the whole city <laughs> was lit up. Amazing. It was for sure. Yeah. And where did you guys go in Tuscany? Because it's a, you know, it's a big place. We spent most of the time in Florence. We rented a little flat. We mm-hmm. took the kids and the moms and we went to, uh, we were like four blocks from the Duomo and just spent, you were there too. You were in, in, was there, in yeah. Italy as well. Uh, I got to say, my favorite part of the trip, in spite of Florence being a culinary mecca for me and the wines and the people and everything, um, a stop in Torino was mm. outstanding. The Piemontese culture, the, the food, the art was pff, incredible. Yeah. And what about you? You've been on the road. I was on the road. Yeah, I went to Tuscany as well. I started, well, I started in Paris. Mm -hmm. Um, did a little World Lambrusco Day action on the Eiffel Tower, which was wild. (laughs) What a combination Uh, of things. What a combination. (laughs) Wow. It was pretty cool. But yeah, so I did World Lambrusco Day with a former guest who we talked about Tuscany with, Filippo Bartolotta. And then, yeah, I made my way down to Chianti Classico, which is amazing. This is my third time to Tuscany in the last two years. And honestly, it just gets better every time I go. I love it, the food, the culture, the people, the wines. And then I actually finished in Turkey, which I didn't wow. Yeah, I didn't actually Fun. really post a lot about. It was sort of a personal trip thing that I wanted to do. So yeah, we spent some time in Istanbul and I have to say the food was so surprising. I mean, we forget that it's sort of, you know, it's it's the the middle ground between Europe and Asia. Mm-hmm. And so there's the such a spice. totally yeah. uh, and just a great cultural influence coming from lots of different places. So yeah, the food food was incredible in Turkey. The culture is incredible to see because you got super super old and you've also got a little like modern twist right, as well yeah. so yeah uh, had a great time I'm hoping to get to Mexico City next though you have, I love well, Mexico you, City you will tie it all in because there's a lot of like Turkish and Middle Eastern yeah. culture especially by the pastor tacos yes <laughs> doing a yes. pastor yes. taco tour you it'll bring you back to the Middle East yeah, for sure yeah good point yeah one of the things that I that was one of my first trips I've been to Mexico City it's been years but I assumed that I would go there stupidly and just eat tacos Right? Absolutely. You're in Mexico. Yeah. But you forget that it's a it's a city. It's right? a city. There's they lots of different cultures there. Everything. And yeah. it's just and they it's just done well and just beautiful. The architecture yeah. too is just like the the food is just brought in from all over the world and a great place to, to just walk. We had outstanding yeah. seafood, Japanese food. Yep. And there's also like French influence. You have some places in par with French laundry if I if I may say so, that are right. amazing. Funny enough, Michelin Guide is coming into Mexico and launching early next year. So that'll really put a... It's about our time. Yeah. Yeah. So get there now. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. Well, the second thing I want to talk about, there is an article that came out talking about all the ways that consumers can sort of figure out the wine list. So it, it asked a few people, a few psalms, a few wine writers, uh, what they thought were some tips and tricks for navigating the wine list and the answers were really interesting to me because I actually felt like from my perspective the one of the big misses was like nobody said talk to the psalm 
<laughs> oh, oh, I no. mean, that's, there's a reason no. for the sum to be there. They're driving the uh, list. It's like, talk to them. They're not intimidating. Yeah. They're there yeah. to help. It's yeah. like the artist is in the room. Like, talk to the <laughs> artist. Ask a question. Oh, okay. exactly. So I, I thought, you know, no offense to the article. It's a, it's a really, and I think there's some good little piece in there. But I was curious to get your take because both of you have run wine programs mm-hmm. and worked before. What are some things that, aside from talking to the psalm, yes. are there like tells, are there ways that you feel like when you sit down, you know how to navigate? I would also, I would firstly like to say, I think the idea of ordering the second cheapest bottle, that yes. needs, no. that that is a thing <laughs> that needs to go out of people's minds. And it, it, just, it was brought up in the article. Oh, okay. Wow. So thank you, because I was like, mm, that's not a thing. It's just not, like if a wine is there, it's there with intention, it's priced probably in line with everything else none never once have I thought about putting something there because it's this it just it doesn't make any sense right um but yeah when I navigate a wine list I like to um look at you know I find like things that are kind of like my um my my tell of like how they're pricing things I've looked at something I'm familiar with and how it's priced to Mm -hmm. see how fairly that is and that kind of gives me an idea about how everything else might be things I don't know Mm -hmm. One thing to not do is do not pull out your phone and oh, start looking no at it. No wine searcher. Like, no. It's, that is Be not, adventurous. Yeah, that's yeah. not um, an indication of how something is. You wouldn't look at a steak on a menu and then start Googling how other steaks are priced in the neighborhood. That's you know, fair. There's a lot of things that go into a wine list and pricing. I like to be rocked. I mean... I look at a list, mm-hmm. and if there's a producer I love and I don't have at home, or maybe I do, and mm-hmm. I just want to try a deeper vintage, I'll go there. But I love to try things that I've never had. Mm-hmm. But then that's where the expertise. If there's a sum in the restaurant or in the floor, ask. But to me, it's like, just go crazy. Just throw yeah. it out there. Obviously, don't break the piggy bank. Yeah. I'm not, never going to spend $300 on a bottle I've never heard of, and right. nobody's there to guide. I'm really picky with champagne, for instance, mm-hmm. and I... There's a time and place for me for oxidative styles of champagne and oak, mm-hmm. but I tend to go with like a livelier, more precise and energetic style of bubbles. Yeah. So I always rely on, on the sums. When there's a grower producer, which is a huge boom right now in the United States, of yes. brands you've never come across, they're like, bam, everywhere. And it's fun. It's like, okay, tell me what you think of this one. I want to get acquainted with why there are four generations and why they stopped selling their fruit to mm-hmm. a big house and mm-hmm. now making their own. So those things are exciting to me. Yeah. And coming home with something like, wow, I wrote that down. I took a picture and totally. now I'm going to look for it and either try to offer it in wine access or try to have it at home. Yeah. And my other thing would be looking at by the glass. Like wherever they're by the glasses, you can get an idea about like where – the style of the restaurant's wine list kind of lives. Like if it's a lot of French wine or if it's a lot of Italian wine or a lot of local wine, you're like, okay, so that's what they're showcasing. If I'm going to look for a bottle, I'll let that by the glass selection kind of guide me. Like if they're very Spanish heavy, I'm going to look at the Spanish selection they have on the list. That is always my advice. I'm so glad you brought that up because I think it's it's so obvious when you sit back and think about it. But yeah, like if the list is dominant in a particular region or a particular style, yeah. that's probably the place that you want to be. Just like, you know, if you went to an Italian restaurant and they also had sushi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe don't order the sushi. Like, yeah, yeah, maybe exactly. if it's called like, you know. Giovanni's, <laughs> like <laughs> stick with the bolognese, right? Exactly. Um, and I, yeah, I think the same can be said with with wine lists. And certainly, you guys have worked with regionally specialized wine lists that you mm-hmm. know, like there are a few things that you will put on outside of those regions to sort of accommodate, especially right. in Napa Valley. But yeah. yeah, by and large, I mean, if distributors and producers know that like that's where your bread and butter is, that is typically where they want to showcase their wines. And so, these wine programs are more likely to get better allocations, things that you can't, you know, necessarily necessarily find outside of the restaurant. That's a great so. point. For like for instance, like your Spanish restaurants, they used to have some champagne and a little sprinkle here and there, right? Of we gems. always we always kept some stuff or on hand because yeah. you know, some sometimes an occasion calls calls for something else. But um but you're right. The the by the glass drove what allocations I would get and by the bottle mm-hmm. and made those things more affordable, more accessible and more available. So um yeah, it's a great it's a great point. It's a whole yeah. economic behind the wine list. There yes. is, you learn so much when you become a wine buyer in a restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> it's a game, but it's a good game. And speaking of a game, I hope you guys are playing along with us and drinking 
courtesy of the yes. Wine Access shall Unfiltered we? Wine Club. We shall. I mean, we're yes. here for this. So if you're not playing along with us, this is uh, this is the Tempranillo from uh, Zinio, from Bodega Zinio. Um, if you are not a member of the Wine Access Unfiltered Wine Club, well, this is your cue to rectify this immediately because 2023 is about to be your year. You're going to finish strong. You're going to finish it with our very last shipment. And you're going to have a great time with it. We all select the wines. These guys are amazing at helping me find some really, really cool wines. You're a big for part, it. too. And you, you yeah, tell the stories. Yeah. We love that. We have a good time. So uh, when we come back, we'll be drinking this wine right here. In the meantime, hit pause, like this video if you're watching it. Subscribe to the channel if you're watching it. And, of course, if you have a second to leave us a review, in addition to signing up for the wine club, well, that's we your key so as well. We love that, too. All right. See you guys in a second. All right, cheers, you guys. Cheers, 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 cheers. cheers. Let's talk Salud. about. Let's talk about. Yeah, how do you say cheers in Spanish? Salud. 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 Which means Salud. health, right? I love it. All right, España. I have been once. It was in college. We <laughs> only made it to Barcelona. I did Beautiful. see the Sagrada Familia. Nice. Nice. Yeah. But check beyond, that. But beyond that, it was sangria in my glass. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> so vineyards have not made their way into my life uh, from those parts, but I know you guys have been there f at least a few times, and you I've, yeah, yeah. I, it's a place. If you love wine, you need to be drinking Spanish wine. You sh you should go to Spain. It is such a mosaic of of styles, of regions, of I mean dialects. Like you, it, in this small compact space, you have so much, and they produce a lot of the world's wine. Yeah. They, I think their production, you know, per, you know, for their, for this, for the area is the largest, um, one of the largest producing countries in the world. So like it, you should, everyone should be drinking more Spanish wine and it's just so affordable, so delicious. Yeah. Um, I've had the pleasure of traveling throughout Spain and doing a, a number of regions. Eduardo has been there once as well, um, to a region I actually haven't been to. Yeah. And I count the days till I can go back. Loved it. And Spain is not to be overlooked. It's got such a range. You right. have some champagne-style method production of mm -hmm. Cava, sparkling, mm -hmm. which is produced pretty much throughout, to crisp whites, to a little oxidative white, fresh, elegant wines, and then something like this that's a little more elegant. And yeah. then you go in Rivera del Duero, you have Vega Sicilia, one of the biggest wines of the world. So there's a range and a lot of hit rich history yeah. that goes into that. Well, speaking of which, there's actually one other wine in this shipment it, that is also from Spain, also from Rioja, mm -hmm. uh, which is another style. So it's an oxidative-ish white. It's the Monopole from Cune, oh, uh, which is topped yeah. with a little sherry, Yeah, I'm sure you guys are familiar with. So uh, there are two, Spain is well represented in this shipment. So um, if, you, if you want to listen to this episode with that wine, you can do so, but we're actually saving that for or another episode we're going to be doing later. But, okay, so Spain, it's a, it's a country, obviously, so <laughs> lots of different styles, just like you would find in any other wine-producing mm -hmm. country in the world. Um, Rioja, probably the most famous of the regions, really, yeah. right? Yes. And the primary grape, say it with me. Tempranillo. 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 Named yes. for its early ripening uh, characteristic. So, yeah, it's... Right? So temprano means early. Yes, we have our, means <laughs> our like, translator here. There you go. Thank little, you. Little, little early one, I think, is <laughs> yes, little, early one. little early one. Thank you. Um, and definitely the backbone of Rioja, um, and which they're usually blends. This is nice because hundred percent. So you really get an understanding of like what tempranillo is. And so, what is tempranillo? How would you characterize it as a grape, as a wine? It's a red grape. We'll start there. Okay. Uh, it's not the like the the most highly aromatic grape. It's you're you're really talking about something that has some richness to it, some earthiness to it. Really red fruited mm -hmm. always, and then um, with the process in Rioja with aging it, it starts to take on these more earth characteristics and a little bit of the oak. It's it's heavy enough to take on some oak flavors and still still stand up. Mm -hmm. um, nice tannins, tannins that will definitely serve it in a long life. Uh, tannins that will preserve it for years and years and make it one of those those wines you can just really enjoy f for decades. And yeah. we, we have to look back at the history, right? Mm -hmm. And how it all started. So Bordeaux was a huge part of Rioja, and we often forget that. Mm -hmm. So when phylloxera happened in, in France, a lot of the, the winemakers saw their, their vineyards decimated, and some of them just packed their bags, and they just headed south on the train, found this region, and there's like... There's so much knowledge already from winemaking in Bordeaux that was brought over 
barrels included, mm -hmm. and they grabbed Tempranillo and they said, this is the chosen one. It's mm -hmm. like the Matrix and Neo is like, you are the chosen one. <laughs> so was. Tempranillo, early ripening, it was successful. It was, it was already loving the region, mm -hmm. and then it was put in the barrel to, to take on this mm. extra layers of coats, which is pretty fascinating. I didn't know that. And yeah, the train, so where this uh, Rioja Alta, the, the main city there, Haro, the train lines literally run right into it mm. and go those train lines went straight to Bordeaux and they were just packing up wine taking it to France um, and distributing it there when friend when the French winemakers were were kind of at a loss for grapes um, so right in front of some of these wineries are still those train tracks it's it's a really cool you know connection and then the American oak in Rioja comes because Spain had such a strong economic ties with the New World mm -hmm. and so wanted to support that and so brought in the American oak which has become mm -hmm. kind of traditional but there are a lot of wineries use a mix which you get in the wine it's just like it gives a little bit of the vanilla a little bit of the dill but there's a there's also French oak used yeah so it is a cross-section and definitely the most famous region of Spain but um you know, it's it's one version. Like you're saying, saying there's the there's white wine produced there. There's there's sparkling wine produced there. So, this is just a, a tip of the iceberg. Yeah, this is a very spicy wine. Mm -hmm. I think when people think of Tempranillo, especially from Rioja, they think of like something with spiciness, something that's got a little tobacco on it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes like leather. I mean, it's definitely red fruited in the way that we would see something like a Sangiovese. Yes. Um, but doesn't have like the tartness. Doesn't have like the crazy acidity that Sangiovese can have sometimes and I think for me like it's that perfect middle ground between like you know you don't maybe want a full-bodied Cabernet mm -hmm. like with all those mm -hmm. aggressive tannins but you're not you also want something bigger than like a Pinot or a, a Grenache or something like that so for me it sits right in the middle I know there can be a lot of different styles of Rioja though and I think one of the things we definitely have to talk about is the aging style because unlike in places like the New World where Reserva doesn't really doesn't mean, mean anything. anything. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. In in Spain and specifically in Heavily Rioja, yeah. it does actually mean something. So, which one of you wants to take that? Sure. Um, so yeah. So on on bottles of Sp all Spanish wine, you can have different levels. You can have the Crianza, the Reserva, and the Gran Reserva. And specifically in Rioja and Ribera del Duero, those mean um, spe specific aging for them, mm -hmm. which is a little bit longer than you would find on any other like, Spanish region wine. Um, so this is so a, this is a reserva. So this has to age fully for three years with one year in oak uh, by law. For Crianza, which is the younger level, I should have started there. Uh, it's a two years total with one year in oak, and then for Grand Reserve, it's five years total with two in oak. So one of the best things about Rioja is they give you the opportunity to buy a wine that's already been aged. Right. You know, it's not like in a, a wine region like Napa where you're buying a 2022 cab and then you have to do the work. And they're like, pump the brakes on that <laughs> one. I know it was $150, but you're going to want to sit down on that. Like, these are ready to go. Right? These are ready to go. They've, yeah. do, they've done the work of aging it in their cellars. The wine's never moved until that, you know, for a ground reserve for five years. Uh, so they've done the work for you, which means you're getting them at, I think always a premium. Um, some a lot of wineries age longer and longer. Famously, Lopez de Heredia uh, ages for you know I think their current release is the 2011 2012. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of Rioja producers do the do the work for you, and they have these massive cellars to hold this wine, yeah. which is so cool. And I think we should also talk about the architecture if you okay. ever go mm -hmm. to Rioja. Yeah, let's talk about the architecture because I haven't seen it. Yeah, to entice everyone to also go visit this region, there is like a there's a real history of the architecture being kind of at the forefront. Um, you know, particular well, some of the older wineries like Kune have it's called Eiffel's Cellar, mm. designed by the guy that did the yeah, Eiffel that's Tower. Where um, and this was produced in like the in the 1850s. So going back all that, and wow. it's beautiful, and there's no, it's huge, and there's no there's no pillars. Mm. So it's it's ironwork. That is that was made specifically so you could roll barrels around. That's so crazy. Isn't that crazy? They were like building these things like pre electricity. Yes, that is <laughs> wild. And so this, not only were the French bringing their you know ideas about viticulture, but architecture, yeah. and brought it into this region and built this beautiful cellar they still use today. And it's it's massive. Mm -hmm. And then you're, they're like, oh, there's zero pillars, so you can just it's a working winery and gorgeous. Um, and then more recently, um, Frank Gehry has come in like. Done, I think, as Marcus de Riscal. Um, there's this architectural mm. wars mm -hmm. in uh, in the 90s and the 2000s, and some of these buildings. There's one that's like it just looks like waves. Mm. Um, 
there's one that's just like it looks like folded metal. Like it's become a, a telltale of Rioja huh. to build these wildly like elaborate modern um, facilities on top of wineries that have been there for 150 years. Yeah. And so when you visit there, you're obviously going to be drinking wine, seeing yes. architecture, but we're also going to be eating. eating. And there is some incredible food, that's for sure. Yeah. Tell a me. A lot of experiences. Tell me all yeah. about the food. So, I mean, a lot of the, uh, unlike other parts of the world, a lot of the wineries have their own restaurants, mm -hmm. which are worldly acclaimed. Like in Mendoza. Like in Mendoza. Yeah. There mm -hmm. you go. And they, you sit down, you try the wines, and you have this incredible 12, 14 course meal mm -hmm. that it becomes pretty much the norm. And it's outstanding. Like, Laura, what's the last one you went to in the... Uh, in Rioja? Was this... Um, I mean, I so I was there in the springtime, which mm -hmm. is, it's very traditional. I eat a lot of baby lamb. Okay. And um, so they just grill it over, super simple, grilled, and then throw some like rosemary into the into mm. the charcoal. Or yes, like, it that with this wine was outstanding. Um, and this, that was really the traditional meal that I I ate all through Rioja and then Ribera del Duero, even Vega Cecilia, mm -hmm. which is one of the most. Right. Lamb. I love it. Yeah. I and love it. Amazing olive oil. Oh. I love that they, obviously they take winemaking very seriously. We can see that with how long they're aging, they're, what they're farming. But I also love that like wine isn't so precious mm -hmm. and neither is food. Like we take them seriously, mm -hmm. but it's yep. like, just drink the wine and eat the food. Like it's meant to be enjoyed and savored, but not like, you know, you're not doing this. I mean, unless you're going no, to 14 yeah. course meals, but like I, I, th I found that in Mendoza too. Like, you know, everything is taken very seriously. It's not like they're just thrown by the wayside, but I think it's, to me, that's like my favorite accessible. way. It's accessible. Yeah. Yes. It's not fussy and meant to be enjoyed. And all of that work, especially in Spain where they put, you know, a v Vegas Sicilia, they put 10 years of time and effort into this bottle of wine. Yeah. And then they open it and it's meant to be savored and enjoyed and, and with friends, with people, with great food. It's, um, so yeah, it's like, it's, it's the reward of all of that time, all that patience, 150 years of know-how is meant to be, cel be celebrated. be celebrated. thing about having the Crianza Reserva and Gran Reserva yeah. is that True. Crianza could be your movie night. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. you just grab it, you just grab some tapas, some, something fun and crazy. Where the Gran Reserva takes the time and plays, and you open it, the canter for two hours yeah. and such. And yeah, I mean, but this wine, what's in this glass, I, I love the, it has so many layers. It starts opening up if, as we go back to it. It's like watching the good, bad, and the ugly, or like <laughs> Cinema Paradiso, and it's just unveiling a plot. Yeah. Eduardo always was the best sure. metaphor. Sure, <laughs> yeah. We're just peeling it's back fun. the layers. It's huh? intriguing. You're just sitting there always like, what's Clint Eastwood going to do? <laughs> like, so this this is a musky, elegant. It's just taking the <laughs> layers. Yeah. But it ha even in the 15 minutes or so since we've opened it, mm, it has. It's changed I, so I much. love that you said like leather and this like red fruit. I, I think that's totally it's in there. A handful of garig, like herbs and things yeah. like that. Yeah. All right. So that's Rioja. Yeah. In a five minute nutshell <laughs> <laughs> um and yeah and as we move around the country you have uh galicia did i say that okay galicia, yeah. galicia. galicia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh to the northwest which is like which is um home of albarino right those Mencia, crisp white albarino. wines and it's got that it's influenced by the atlantic i mean you got to remember like spain has water on on most of its sides mm -hmm. and they influence it differently so you get these different styles of wine and different people i think galicia like they are gaelic right so they come from you know, uh, from cooler. Ireland, yeah. Scotland, like that's where those people come from. And you go over to Penendez or you go into Catalonia and it's a totally different, different language, oh, different type yeah. of people, different wine tradition. Those that came over, you know, more on the Mediterranean side. So you get this all sorts of all sorts of mesh, mesh of things um, as you travel around. And if then, you, if you I mean, if we back. if we were going to go down south. Talk about sherry, absolutely, ah, and, and, sherry, and the influence, yeah. you know, of Valencia, the paella, and the wines that go with it, like Bobal and such. I, I love looking at a country uh, from a culinary perspective. Like, yeah. what are you eating? That's how your wines are. <laughs> Bardo's hungry. I'm just, so hungry. I'm just sorry, making myself Bardo. hungry. But Galicia, for instance, shellfish and a lot of seafood, right? So the wines like Mencia and like Albariño give that saltiness, kind of like almost like Campania does to like the Positano area. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Naples. But and then as you go down, like paella is from Valencia, right? Mm -hmm. So you have this wealth of like either meaty, savory, poultry, uh, animal paellas or, mm -hmm. or shellfish in bulk. Some sausage, and some the rabbit, wines yeah. kind of like enhance that. They're not fighting. You're not making a yeah. and Rioja tying it all back is like yeah, you have a lot of lamb, a lot of uh, cow, a lot of beef and things like that. Yeah. Throw them in the like Mendoza kind of Mendoza kind of yeah. uh, component, and the wines adhere to that. Yeah. They're there to lift it. It's pretty pretty fascinating when you look and at I Spain. And I think we've we've talked about chocolate, and that's yes. like another yes. thing yes. Oh, all, in, all into and itself, and yes. the beautiful area where that's from. And it, I think they filmed some of Game of Thrones out there. Mm. Like it's very like it's it's a very dramatic coastline, um, and those wines are so unique. Like I don't yeah. think there's anything in the world that really mm -hmm. does. Yeah like taste like that I mean they're just very unique wines so. yeah isn't it I mean I mean we have in the span of like 15 minutes talked about like seriously like wildly different styles oh, and oh, grapes bullied. and like it I mean it's pretty impressive like the amount that Spain can pull in because we're also talking about different climates different terroirs mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. cultures even within you know the same country uh should I even add like do you have a favorite time and, and it can be me. it can be to visit and then to eat and drink I mean, I think like the culinary, the the culinary ingenuity of Catalonia, because that's where El Bulli is mm. or was. Mm -hmm. I mean, so yeah. that True. tradition that changed how we eat around the world with like, right. that, you know, molecular gastronomy yeah. and, and like. You still see like Fran Adria as like. Yep. Yeah. So that to me is an exciting place culinarily. Um, I think for wines, like what I love to do, I like the cooler wines of Rias Baixas. I like mm. the, the mentias that you get over there. Um, but, I, you know, an old bottle of Rioja to me feels like a gift. I mean, they're, you can get them with like, you can get them with 20 years of age on them. They're so good. And yeah. you, can, you, can, you can afford to open two of them. <laughs> I like where your head's at. Um, and I love sherry. I do. I, I am a fan Sherry's of sherry. Sherry's definitely yeah. a fantastic so, I like that. Is that a favorite? Is it, did I mention Certainly. four? But um, to me, like a lot of Priorat, it's over, often oh, overlooked, but the wines have so much consequence yes. yeah. and presence. And then depending in this area where you have the sparkling wines, yeah. Scarello, uh, Parelada, all this Chardonnay uh, traditional method of, mm -hmm. of champagne uh, style production. Those are beautiful, and the people are great. And then, not to veer off from wine, but then you have Asturias and ciders and all these yes. different. Oh, how oof. did I forget about the Basque region ciders? Oh, oh man, yeah. I mean, this is, this is a country that knows how to drink. I know. Why did we and, do a podcast on an entire did they country? They invent the gin and tonic because they certainly drink like they invented the gin oh, yeah. and tonic. And you can do it yeah. six-hour lunch, and then move into tapas, <laughs> have some gin and tonics, and then move to dinner. And it's impressive. basically you eat and drink. Last time I was in Barcelona, it's a, I, I went to a place because I was starving right off the airplane. And they're like, no, we open at 9 p.m. I'm like, oh, wait, oh, it's it. 7. I was like, come on. Yeah. And yeah, you start at 9 p.m. and you go till 1 in the morning eating. And that's just early. Right. Which I love that part of the yes. culture. Yeah. Be warned, if you are going to Spain, you will not be fed dinner until close to midnight yeah that's that's when it starts so just like prepare yourself that's why the tapas and tapas mm -hmm. don't count as food the tapas yeah. are just to, to like you. fuel <laughs> it's you a vehicle to keep drinking yes exactly. it's to fuel you through the drinks and and that that's all they are and um yeah what a what a great place to eat and drink just where do we wealth. stand on sangria time and place you know growing <laughs> up for me um <laughs> My whole family used to go to the beach, uh -huh. right? So it would be sometimes eight of us. We'd take over a hotel or two, like boutique hotels. Uh -huh. And my grandpa would get all this, usually Riojas and Tempranillos, and all these like base level Crianza wines, right? Put them into a the massive thermos. We would be there for a week, the whole family, and we would take turns cooking and stuff. I was a kid, right? But my grandpa put this thermos and put all this fruit and everything. And not that he was Spanish, but he loved that part of the culture. Yeah. And the thermos was there, the sangria, for anybody to go and, and put, just pour a little bit. Us, we were like 80 years old, and we're little like, Little baby oh, Eduardo is like, <laughs> That's how you got to start. And, and you in start wine. stumbling and just falling all over the place. But that, to me, was a beautiful part of the culture, that it's there. You put the ice, yeah. you put a little bit of Sprite sometimes, but mix it up. Yeah. And, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful thing, gets things going. It's not to be taken serious or be decredited, right. but it's it's a fun part of the the beverage world. Do yeah. you drink it? I 
I do drink it. I do. Yeah, I think sangria is fun. And I think if you add, um, you know, some like nice quality or like, you know, brandy brandy and a little bit more alcohol. (laughs) I feel like it needs to be fortified a little bit. But um, yeah, if it's made right, it's a great drink. And yeah. yeah, I'm what else? Say you... It's making a comeback in the mixology world. Yeah, I I'm, would I'm not drink it out of a can. I feel like oh, you need. I feel like yeah, you need no. to make it. I mm-hmm. feel like part of sangria, the love of it is family is, recipes. Is doing it yeah. is like getting everyone kind of involved, and you peel the oranges and you grab this, and yeah, oh, we have an extra apple on the counter. Throw that in, like that's. That's Last year beauty. for 4th of July, I made a sangria, I don't know if you remember, with sake. I don't remember. It was red wine, I but I had a little bit of sake of in there. Because it was like, cool, let's just add yeah. this and that and all this citrus and stuff. I had a little yuzu. And after that party, everybody texted me like, oh, what's the recipe? So I'm like, I, I don't remember exactly you what was in there. Clean out your fridge. Oh, that sounds really <laughs> clean good. Clean out your fridge. And if you have sake, it adds a little kiss of fun <laughs> in there. I love that. I made it with port recently. Ooh. Yeah. Yes. So if you just need like a single serving of. Oh. Yeah. Ruby. Did you let it sit for a little? Well, no. tell us. No, because I mean, port is already fortified. True. Mm-hmm. So there's already a little brandy in there. There's already sugar, so natural sugar. So you yeah. don't need to make it any sweeter. Okay. So that with like a little ginger beer, I hit a club soda and a touch of orange juice and then whatever fruit. Money. Over you ice. You need to patent that drink. I know. Yeah. Somebody <laughs> else came up with it. But, Oof. but like, I made it for my mom over the summer, and she was like, this is amazing. So Over ice? You drank yeah. it over ice? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah over yeah, ice. Yeah. Okay. Definitely over ice. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Do you drink sangria without I, ice? No, I think you have to have it with ice. No, yeah, no. yeah right? Yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely no ice. You need ice. Uh, yeah. So let's go back to this wine, because this is, again, Evolving. changing. Um, obviously, we talked about food pairings, but in terms of, like, I love, I love that we've talked about that they've already aged on your behalf, but do you feel like... This is a wine that could age even longer. Yeah, uh, would that 10, be beneficial? 20 years, no problem. So yeah. we recently featured a 1976 Rioja. Mm-hmm. And a 78, I believe, as well. Side by side, we tasted them with the tasting panel. It was incredible. Mm. These wines were uh, topped off by the winery before releasing recently, like mm-hmm. three years ago. But these are wines that stand testament of time. Yeah. Like, you look at a 2001 Rioja on a, on a list, on a Spanish restaurant... You lay your hat there because that's at a very happy place. There is definitely yeah. upwards and upwards. And even 80s, 90s, I would never overlook a, a, a Rioja with age. Do, would you be concerned if it were a Crianza versus a Reserva? I think Reserva tends to age a little more because think about it. If you're aging a wine that doesn't have the time in oak, right. it's a little fresher. And perhaps the structure, the tannin, the firm tannin and and, and complexity to it Mm -hmm. might not be there so it's a little primal it's still going to be fun but it's going to be a little more like one trick pony Mm -hmm. where if you're tasting an age reserva or grand reserva you have a little more complexity yeah would you No, i I think um i think this definitely has capacity age i think there's uh i think sometimes it depends on the producer and sometimes these producers now at this point aren't putting any age you know reserve any level designation on their bottles to be a little bit you know just that they make their wine and not a, a certain style. Um, so it's knowing your producers, but I really think it's really like with a Crianza bottle, sometimes you do just pack it away and just see it for, you know, 15, 20 bucks. You throw it in yeah. the back of your cellar and you open it up in a few years and you can be blown away. Like, yeah. I think it's a low cost investment on a wine that has a high return on enjoyment. Like the possibility. Totally. So and what's the worst that could happen? Throw it in a sangria. You throw it in a sangria, <laughs> yeah. and, and you know. So I, I really, I, um, yeah. I think the grapes always have a tendency to age well. So yes, the higher up the ladder, the longer you, longer life shelf you typically have. But there's some great crianzas out there that can age. Yeah, I think it speaks to like you know we talk a lot about the wine doesn't necessarily have to be expensive to age, Yep. Mm-hmm. right? Same, I mean, most of the wines in Napa are expensive now, but, <laughs> you know, you don't have to just put away your single vineyard or your, you know, your tzatziki phase. Like, the regular wines that you're getting from Napa, like the regular Cabernets, like, they are age-worthy. And, I mean, we've seen this mm-hmm. how many times with some of those bottlings from, like, mm-hmm. the 60s and 70s that were not necessarily, like, the big fancy bottlings. Yep. It was just the standard stuff, and it, it does incredibly well. Um, we talked about food. We talked about architecture. If you had, if you had never been to Spain before, 
and you were going for the first time to go wine tasting, would it be Rioja that you would go to? Absolutely. Yeah. I would say Rioja or Rivera del Duero, land in Madrid, and then head over there. Uh, just get acquainted with the culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if you only have three, four days to explore, I think that's where I lay my hat. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go I, anywhere. Yeah, I agree. I think Rioja, you know, it just tells the story of the of of viticulture so well and they do great hospitality i would start there it's like if you go to the u.s you would go to napa probably right yeah so same thing it's okay. like that idea of like encapsulates elegance uh a little more of an established area mm -hmm. with more terroir and things like that past that yeah you can explore and, and visit little and i think if you like european wine if you like italian wine this is a great place to start Drinking mm. Spanish wine. If you love Napa Valley, you like that that bigger style, I think Priorat is a great place to start drinking Spain. I love that. That's great, great advice. Yeah, like what are those gateway wines to get you from the new world to the old world? And like, you know, yeah. Rioja sort of mm -hmm. is well, that bridge. Right. It's, it's like Brunello. It's like a Yeah. yeah. Right. Like yeah, I like that that comparison. A great pasta wine, but can go with a steak. And I think if you like, you know, Pinot or Syrah, I think Mencia is a cool grape to check out. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, this would be like, if you love old world wines, this would be a great place to start. If you love new world wines, check out Priorat. Absolutely. Flashy, elegant fruit. French yeah. oak. Yeah. yeah. Licorice. And don't, mm. don't sleep on kava. No. If, if I had one piece of advice for like. It's um, more sunscreen. <laughs> <laughs> for like a oh. wedding or a party or, you know, you want to do sparkling wine, do kava. They have to eat, they have to make it like champagne. You can get great values. Mm -hmm. Like I think Cava is like bang for your buck for for sparkling wine. What's the one you always stand behind and got me into Gramona? Gramona. Yeah. Yeah. That's I mean, then standard. you can you can really go up and up and up. Actually, they have the same ratings. They have, you know, they don't call them Crianza. They have Reserva, Gran Reserva, and it has to do with the aging mm -hmm. on the lees. So if you like, if, or if you don't like those really oxidative styles of champagne, stay away from a Gran Reserva or like that kind of yeah. long aging. So it. They, they help you out on the bottle, but yeah, what a great value. Yeah. Once upon a time, you guys had one. It was like the Messias Salah or something. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's like, that is... It was like $12. Yeah. What a Get great, it by the case. Have people buy. over. Make mimosas. You wouldn't feel bad about it. No. And everybody's happy. Yeah. Like, and they, yeah, they they took their, they their sparkling wine know-how comes from champagne. That's how Spain ended up making wine. And then they they took their own twist on it. They invented yeah. the gyro palette. Mm -hmm. Oh, the that's thing fun. That automates riddling. And so that's one thing that brings the cost down. And um, so that was kind of their contribution to, okay. to the sparkling wine world. All right. Besides eating and drinking, uh, any other recommendations in terms of like, I mean, do you go see a football game while you're there? Oh, man. Like, <laughs> do you? Yes. And that's where the <laughs> rivalries, that one. Yeah. rivalries come in the house. Okay. Whether you're going to go see a Real Madrid game or Barcelona <laughs> or Atletico de Madrid and all this. I mean, going to a game in Spain. Yeah. It is just as amazing as seeing you know, a game in, in, in London yeah. or, uh, or in Italy. Yeah. Like the intensity, the rivalries, the excitement, whether you know, have no clue about what's going on in the field, yeah. you're a first timer, if you can lock in a ticket, you can bathe in the excitement. It's like seeing Taylor Swift. For me, I was not into <laughs> it. And once I was there, I was like, holy crap, I'm yeah. behind this. Same thing with a soccer game. Uh, but also great hiking, great uh, yeah, sightseeing, great clubs. If you have a, yeah, yes, oh, true. Barcelona, yeah. Um, if you have like a, a month or two, uh, you can do the Camino de Santiago. Ooh. Oh, the, the walk. Which is the walk, yeah. which is the famous pilgrimage that, you know, you can start actually in France, cross the Pyrenees and go all the way to the ocean. Meditate. Really get your steps in. Really get your steps <laughs> in. Um, and it, I, it used to be a religious, you know, experience right. and you go from... From church to church, and now it's and now people do it just to like yeah. reconnect with themselves or just to cross it off the bucket list. And when oh. I was in Spain, I did see people doing this walk with their backpacks on, and yeah. um, it's that to me would be a bucket list thing. Yeah, so. I had a, I had a similar that worked for me that like talked about it all the time that she did the the Camino, and she had the best stories from mm -hmm. it. You yeah. meet so. people, you yeah. You, you know, in, that's one that I had never really considered up until this moment, but maybe that's like. <laughs> You know. It touches through the top of Rio. Yeah, then you don't feel so bad about eating and drinking. You all can the eat time. and drink your way, so. and just still feel yeah, still feel really good. And you go through some amazing wine regions, and there's something about like a, a scallop shell, and and you, you collect things. Oh. There's the whole whole culture to it. So and there's another one not to be overseen that you can talk about, Laura. The Feria de Jerez. 
Yes. Oof. So down in Jerez in the spring, there is a... Which is where Sherry is. Where is. Sherry is, yes. So um, there's a, a ferrier fair, and all of the biggest, the bodegas of all of Jerez come and parties, and it's a, it's kind of like a, like also horse show. There's, they're big into the equestrian culture down there, and you Flamenco wear, shows. I yes. mean, the music, the excitement. And it's just the, a constant oof. party. It's a party for about a week. It's like um, carnival. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I got to go one year. Um, a little more PG than carnival. She, if you're <laughs> not watching this right now, Laura's face is like, <laughs> I she did, has a lot of I, secrets I, that I she's keeping. Um, and to make us feel welcome, and part of it, they gave us they actually gave us the dra- the traditional dress, like the whole Fit floral you, the whole thing. thing with the tassels, and it was so much fun. Everyone's in everyone's in these dresses. Everyone mm. is dressed up. The men are in in suits, and it's like another world. And that is, if you can be down in Jerez in the spring, it is a. I'm there. You will you will learn to love. I mean. Cherries poured everywhere, and then it, it's just a party. It's it's unbelievable. And the other one is Pamplona. You can go really do the oh. run of the bulls if you oh, feel adventurous I'm... to the next level. <laughs> I hey, said, come back home with like a horn a on your side. You want to run with the bulls. <laughs> yes, why not? It's like you got to do it once. Tomato, if you make it back, you're good. One? Jordan, I'm trying to drink, not yes. die. Okay. There's what? also a tomato, I believe it's Valencia, and, and it's the Where world that tomatoes just tomatoes rock loads. Other? Yes. And in Rio, how they do one with wine. I think at the end of Harvest, where they pour wine all over. Like, what? There's all. They yeah. drink, they celebrate. I, it's, we gotta go. What a culture. We need to do an, a podcast episode there. Absolutely. Yes. yes. Yep. Rio Hub Part you hear 2. That? You hear that? <laughs> Bean counters. <laughs> <laughs> Joe of the fishes. <laughs> this is what's happening. Yeah. People have spoken. Speaking of which, uh, would you do us the honors of pronouncing this beautiful bottle's yes. name at the very end of the episode. Yes. So, Thinio. So, just remember when you're saying the, the a C or an S mm-hmm. or a Z, you're, you're saying it with a lisp. Okay. Like Thursday, oh. right? Okay. So, Thinio, Thinio. Reserva, Rioja. You do oh. it like... Oh. Rioja. It kind of goes like the Rioja. Uh, and it's a uh, denominación de origen, de origen calificada, which means it's the, uh, the similar to the Italian... DOCG, Denominación de Origen de Controlata. Mm-hmm. So you're, it's a, the stamp from the government, government material. And of Bloody. which there's only two that are in that top category. Where yes. like it's Italy, there's, I think, 85 DOCGs. Uh, right. Let me count. No. <laughs> uh, there's only two of the, at that level in Spain, and it's Rioja and Priorat. Yes. Okay. And it's um, patrocinio, which means like uh, owned by or. Okay. or Patronize, if you will, and terrazinos. Yeah, so that's that's pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, women-run winery, just like that. Yes. delicious wine, and what a cool packaging! It's one you'll remember for sure. Definitely, yes. We love the yellow label. Um, if you want a little bit more tasting note, I did the tasting video for this, so I will link it on all the places. Um, super reasonably priced, uh, but a wine that can age and is delicious, 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 delicious right now. Oh. And continues to change. Yeah, so definitely, going. like, <laughs> no, I don't think there's any need to decant this. I think this is a wine that is evolving at a rate that will be gorgeous just right out of your totally. glass. Um, as always, get a little bit of a chill on this wine, you know, to really sort of bring out some of the aromatics, but keep those, like, pokey alcohol things down a, a touch. Mm-hmm. Um, and then make sure you're eating because... Yes. Yeah. If you're not hungry by the end of this episode. Yeah, I don't know. You weren't listening. <laughs> yes, indeed. You definitely listened to it too fast and you were distracted. So thank you guys so much. What thank a fun you. one. Thanks yeah. for the invite. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks for taking much. us on the trip through uh, Spain. Yeah, yeah. a little yeah. love letter to Spain. We uh, love that. For those of you who were listening to this episode that want to be drinking with us, this is once again, your reminder to join the Wine Access Unfiltered Podcast you Wine Club. You won't be disappointed. Sure won't. Uh, we, we send it out every other month. It's got four bottles in it. Every bottle corresponds with an episode just like this one. And we have a lot of fun with it. So, cool. All right, you guys. Cheers. Salud. 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 Um, thanks for bringing it full circle. Always appreciate that. Salud. Salud.